We are having the hardest... Well, let me rephrase that. I am having the hardest time getting to the top of Moriah. We've been studying 20 weeks or better and we ain't got that poor guy up to kill that kid yet. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 21. Hallelujah. And while you turn to Genesis 21, I'm going to the New Testament to the writing of uh, Apostle Peter. And I'm reading in chapter 1, verse 3. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Everybody say it, i got something waiting on me. Said it's reserved. It's reserved. Said I ain't reserved. I ain't reserved. It's reserved. It's reserved. <laughs> Say I'm preserved. I'm preserved. That means Pentecostal pickle. <laughs> you know how you get something preserved? You got to add something to it to keep it from rotting, to make it sweet, to keep it a long time. I'm feeling good right now. Hallelujah. The Bible said we are preserved in Christ Jesus. There ain't one way you can get preserved. You need that power from another world to get in your soul and give you a heaven-sent preservative. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Who are kept by the power of God through faith on the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Who are kept by the power of God. God, I can't get off of here. Who are kept by the power of God. We live in a generation who are keeping themselves by what they think they believe. You can't do that. You can't even be kept by what you think you believe. The Bible said you're kept by the power of God. And the Scripture says that the Word of God and the Spirit of God is the power of God. Because it's revealed in the Gospel, which is the power of God. The Gospel is the power of God. And it says you are kept by the power of God. Well, then you can't separate gospel truth from God's power. And the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 1 through 3. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Find its fulfillment in those steps. Death, burial, resurrection. Repentance, baptism, infilling of the Holy Ghost. Death, burial, resurrection. That's the gospel. Kept by the power of God, through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice. See, that just made us happy. Now we got another part. Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And we can all say amen to that. We are a strange composite of happy and lousy. Of up and down. I'm so sure, but I'm not sure. I know He loves me, but I wonder if He does. We are a composite of extremes. I got the power, but I believe the enemy's got the power today. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor. Am I right? Yeah. Praise and honor. I got a paper clip here. And glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What did he just say? He just told you a great revelation. You're going to stay in the fire till he shows up. He said the trial of your faith is going to come to its fullness at the glory of his appearing. And until he shows up, you stay in the furnace. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. One more scripture. I'm sorry to keep you standing so long, but I'm excited. First Peter 4.12 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. See, that's the part we ain't never got. We get the rejoicing over the promise. I got a place reserved. I got a crown. I got a robe. I ain't never going to die. He's going to keep me. But now he's not Peter messes it all up and says, Hey, by the way, all the crud and junk you're going through, rejoice. So get glad when you're sad. Because when you're sad, it ain't that bad. 
Says our dad. The poet don't know the speech show it. They're long fellows. Hallelujah. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Okay, I'm getting to my text now. I'm in Genesis chapter 21. Do you remember the last lesson we had? In verse 30, And he said, For these seven you lambs thou shalt take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. You remember that lesson? Woo, living by the well, it cost seven lambs. Oh, hallelujah. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there he swear, because there they swear, both of them. Thus they made a covenant in Beersheba, and Abimelech rose and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba. That's as far as we got last time. And called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines land many days. Continue. And it came to pass after these things. After what things? After all the good stuff. After a long period of refreshing and enjoying God. After these things, God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham? And he said, Behold, here am I. Oh, praise God. I want to continue with Mariah's masterpiece message. He ain't going to get to the top of the mountain yet, but we're getting there. Lord, bless the teaching of the Word and help me do a great job. Bless these wonderful people. In your name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Now I realize it's, it's 8.03. It's Wednesday. We've got kids to go to school. We've got jobs to go to. Please don't leave till I'm finished. If you even have your carcasses here, don't let your mind leave. Because it's very, very important what I'm fixing to say. It's extremely important. Last time we talked about how uh, the wells and how he, he got these, uh, this well and he bought it for seven lambs and, and he enjoyed it and he planted a grove and he lived there and he just had a wonderful time. The Bible said Abraham sojourned there in the Philistines' land many days. But I'd like to tell you that there are times in God's divine economy where he gives you sort of a breather. He gives you a reprieve from the pressure. And uh, if you're not careful, you'll think you arrived. And all it is is a reprieve for a few moments for something bigger. You, you don't ever arrive till he gets here. And, and this is so beautiful. And I, I just want to go over this step by step. Please remember that the ark that Noah built saved the elephant and the squirrel. And the ark that God has for you and I is going to save the weak and the strong. The big and the small. The honorable and the insignificant. All are going to have to go through the door. All are going to have to go through the blood. All are going to have the same way in. They've got to stay in the same place. But the ark is capable of saving and protecting and securing anybody. I want you to get some encouragement from that. So now God finally decided to give Abraham a little bit of rest. And he gave him a little bit of refreshing. And so he's there for a long time. The Bible said he, he stayed there many, many days. And he's enjoying the grove. And he's enjoying the well. And he's enjoying the tranquility of the covenant that he has with Abimelech. And he's enjoying his son Isaac. It's just a, a great time of refreshing in Abraham's life. And my God, the guy needed it. Now this is powerful. A, the scripture says, and it came to pass after these things, after all this time of refreshing, God now begins to call him to his greatest test. After these things, it says, God did tempt him. The original translation says, God did try him or test him. God doesn't tempt people like a devil tempts people. But God tries and tests people. And you might ask the question, well, why does God now come to test him? Because for the first time in Abraham's more than 30 year walk with God, God looks at him and said, He's now ready. 
for what I had in mind clear back in the earth Chaldees. And I led him step by step and he thought each mountain was Everest. And if I would have ever showed him Moriah when he left the earth of Chaldees, he'd still be making idols in the earth of Chaldees. Now I want you to get this because this, this affects us. Because we are children of Abraham by faith. That we are to walk in the steps of that faith that Abraham had, yet being uncircumcised. Long before he ever even got in covenant with God. God had a design for what he wanted to do and fulfill in Abraham's life. And he had the same thing for you. And we need to stop living such low Christian lives. We need to be excited about, hey, God's working in my life. God's picked me up. He's not got some hokey pokey program. He's got a divine plan when He called me out of sin to reveal Jesus Christ to me and forgive me and give me blood and mercy and pardon. That wasn't the ultimate. That was the beginning. He's got something fantastic that He's going to put me on the potter's wheel and help me honor Him. Sometimes I, I get concerned with us apostolic Pentecostals that, that we almost go from pillar to post and from Wednesday to Sunday and that's the whole curriculum of our Christianity. It's Wednesday to Sunday and Sunday to Wednesday and Wednesday to Sunday. Man, there is a program in our Maker's brain. There is something burning like fire in His heart. When He picked you and I up out of the muck and the mire, He didn't want to just save us. He's got a Mariah somewhere. He's got a prayer that He's going to let every episode and every step, though we win or lose, though we fall or we're successful, it doesn't matter. He's got a purpose that He has divinely appointed to our lives and we're going there. That makes life a great venture. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He's now ready. Over 30 years has passed by. He was 70 when he left the earth of the Chaldees. He's well, well over 100 years old now. It's covered 12, 11 chapters from 11 to 22. He's now ready. Every trial, every test, every mistake, every victory were ordered by God to fulfill God's purpose. You say mistakes were ordered? Sure. Every test that comes to you is a revelation whether you win or lose. And you'll, you'll never learn how strong you are until you try to pick up something. And you'll never know how fast you are until you run. Anybody can look at the track and say, you know, I used to run a 440 in. What do you run it now? Oh, I just don't run it no more. I live in memory. Sort of like going, going for in public, and they got the free scales. They wouldn't dare charge you for that information, because I sit there sometimes and watching them, and about nine out of ten men and women just look at the scales when they're walking by, trying to get a paper or a magazine, and they just go, "Hey, look, gal." Because it's always easy to go out of the sliding glass doors and say, "I weigh one forty." Or if they do get on them, you know, they're spring. And so they kind of go over and then they go back a little and then they kind of settle in. I've seen people just go up and watch it start going and just go right on. Jack. When it hits the explosion zone, they're off that thing. Has anybody in this auditorium besides Jeffrey Wayne ever stepped on a scale and fussed with it? Ever hit it? Well, I wish they'd get these scales calibrated. I know what I weigh. I'm in this body daily. What does this dumb scale know? Oh, the devil country called assumption. Oh, hallelujah. Hear me. I got a, I got a great Bible study. I'll get to it in a little bit. I promise I will. So everything has been ordained by God. So that ought to tell us, do not be discouraged. His eye is on you. Yes, His hand guides you. His purposes are forming you. Do not 
be discouraged. Neither get impatient with God because God is never in a hurry. Listen to it. Be encouraged. God, not God Himself, ever dared to cause Abraham to go into a trial or a test that God knew ahead of time He's not prepared for. Oh, I, I, you didn't hear me just that. You've got to grab this. Because this thing that's eating our lunch and beating our brains out sometimes, and we think we're fixing to flip apart and go and say, why does God? You must grab a hold of this knowledge. God doesn't put you in anything that He is not confident that your capabilities and your potential, your potentiality is able to bring you through that thing and help you honor Him and make you more transparent and more honest and more hungry that you want to be more like Him. Even if he lets you go through something and you go to bench press at 240 and it falls back on your chest and crushes you, he will not say you're a failure. He will say, hey, you've learned something about yourself. I knew you couldn't make it, but I'm helping you to work out a little bit more with my power and my spirit to give you the strength because I've got it in my mind. You're going to bench press 350 after a while. That's my goal for you. We need to get delivered from this. That the only reason God saved us was to save us. That's cheap Christianity. That's not why He saved us. He saved us so we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So we might grow and mature and blossom and bring forth fruit. You tell the man that goes through all that dunging and fertilization and plowing and, and pesticiding and all that he ought to just run the aisles and be so thrilled because he planted 12 trees. Well, he may be happy with the new tree and it's birthing, but his great goal is, oh, I, I see in about three years boughs bending low, full of oranges or lemons or tangerines or some type of fruit, apricot or apples or something. He said, yeah, I'm happy that it's doing well and it's growing, but, but I'm not as thrilled as, 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 as you are because I know there's going to be storms and tests and trials and cold winters and hot summers and there'll be dry spells and, and that tree will be attacked by insects and be attacked by nature and weather and, and all kinds of critters will try to kill it, but I'll be here to protect it because I've got a goal for that tree. I see bushels and bushels of fruit come. Listen, God didn't give you the Holy Ghost just so you could talk in tongues and feel goosebumps. He wants fruit in our lives. He wants us to bear fruit. He said, I've ordained you that you bear fruit and that your fruit last. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Listen to me carefully. Be encouraged. I got it written right down here. Be encouraged. I, I, I don't want you to get it. I didn't make that up. I wrote that down. Be encouraged. Listen to this. The test and the trial is heaven's vote of confidence. There hath no temptation taken you but that which is common to man. But God will with every test and trial make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Don't fuss and cuss about the heat of the furnace. Praise and rejoice that God says you're worthy for the fire. Do you know that God's got some people in the body that he can't ever take in the storm? They're just the people that get saved and stay on the dock, stay on the wharf, sing and talk about storms and riding out the storms, but they don't ever get to go. If I understand this Bible, when Jesus fed those 5,000, He only took 12 into the storm. The Bible said He sent the multitudes away. Why? Multitudes only want bread and fish. They only want now. 
But he's got 12 of them and said, I'm sending you in a storm. And I said, how come you... In fact, I was on a motel floor about 12 years ago in Portland, Oregon, preaching the state youth convention when God gave me that thought. I was laying with my face on the floor, squalling a ball, and said, God, how come you sent these people into the storm? You know the end from the beginning. How come you sent them into this storm? And the voice of the Lord spoke to me and said, but they were worthy! My Lord, that wind gets to blow and you need to jump up and say, Thank you, Jesus. You know, sometimes what we label as all hell broke loose, it ain't hell at all. It's heaven moving hell's neck. You don't really believe hell's in charge of anything, do you? Ain't got the keys to his own house. Couldn't lock you up and keep you locked up if he wanted to. He's like the old bad wolf. I'm going to hop and puff and blow your house down. You ain't going to blow the house down that's made out of brick. And we've got one made out of stone. We've got a rock of ages. We're in the top of the rock. You're not going to hop and puff and blow this house down. We're founded on the rock. And the gates of hell ain't never going to prevail against the church. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It ain't healthy for me to stay out of the pulpit long. I know that. I know that. I know that. Just stay with me. I'll get to my Bible study. God is not in a hurry. Our tests and trials and troubles are heaven's boat of confidence. Abraham is now going to go into a higher dimension and a service of God than he ever could have imagined. God is going to use his mounting of Moriah as a picture for all generations to come of God's own sacrifice as He indwelt the man, Christ Jesus. He is now taking this man through his tragedy and his trial into a place of a picture that would last for almost 6,000 gener- 6, years. Can anybody get strength from your trouble? Or do we suffer from halitosis of griping? Boy, I lost the audience. Are we suffering from bad breath? That people get around us and all they hear is about what you can't do and you ain't got the money and God ain't answered prayer and you fussing with this and the boss ain't working, the car's broke. Oh, come on, friend. You think God dumb? He's working every step of a righteous man is ordered of the Lord. That's nothing that the devil of this world or sin or anything could ever do against the children of God or against the truth. It will eventually be turned around for the truth. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'll get to my Bible study here in a minute. I just, I'm just not in a hurry. There's a very great lesson here tonight. It's a great lesson. This man is pushing uh, somewhere around 130 plus years old. Ready for this? Everybody over 50, sit up tall right now. Come on, suck it in. Throw your shoulders back. Let's go. Sit up tall. I want to get a notice of you. Then we'll preach to you for about two minutes. Here's the lesson. We never know what God wants to do with and in us, regardless of length of service or age of life. I worry sometimes about you precious senior saints that for some reason you have no more vision that God will ever do anything magnificent in you. You've raised your kids. Now you play with your grandkids. You've tied. You've given. You've supported. You're older. You're not physically capable. Fine. But you're always spiritually capable. Do any of you precious folks 50 and 60 ever dream of what might be around the corner for you? Or are we just looking for the plot and the six foot hole in the dirt and hope I die sane? Well, well, let's go. I'll, I'll get off your case. You're not too happy now. But let me get to the people who've lived for God for 20 years and are just happy to be saved. Do any of you ever wake up in the morning saying, oh, wonder what new fantastic thing God's going to put me through that I'm going to learn about Him today. 
Or is it that we take our lunch pail and our thermos of coffee and get in our car and say, Well, I hope there ain't too much hell break loose in my life today. I hope heaven stays with me. Could that be why the great revelations are not coming? Could that be why God is, is somehow handcuffed and handicapped that He cannot reveal to us the Marias and the magnificent Marias that He wants to show us in our lives because we got no vision? We're not really expecting to hear God. Do you folks ever pray expecting to hear? Am I the only wacko in this place that goes walking around in his office or prays on his knees or prays when he's driving his car and while I'm praying and I stop and I wait and I pray? I'm literally waiting to feel. I'm waiting to hear. I'm sensing something inside me. This is not a lecture. I'm not lecturing heaven. I'm expecting communication. I'll tell you what, I'm frustrated. If I put an hour, hour or two in prayer and ain't nothing going on and I felt no communication, I feel like just a, a dry jerk that everything's bounced off the roof of my mouth and went as high as the ceiling and that was it. I need to hear something. I need to feel that like God quickens something to me. I spend my whole life studying. That's all I do. I study. I read. I listen to tapes. I walk. I pray. I study. That's all I do. You think it's hard for me to preach a sermon? I got 15 alive in me right now. Think I'm kidding you? I can reach in the back of this Bible. And I can bring out enough stuff, Doc. That'll blow your mind. I study them and write them day and night. I just keep writing them. Ooh, God, good. Wow. Boy, oh, God, they never heard that. Ooh. And I just write them and write them and write them. And it's so crazy because when I get finished and I get ready to preach to you tonight and get ready to preach to you Sunday, everything here is dead. That's right. Because God doesn't let you store up manna. But my job is to study and pray and study and pray. And then when I get ready to come to you, I spread all this out and I begin to bruise over and look over. Anything here, God? Is there anything here? You will know. Okay, well, we'll just do something else. We'll put this away. What do you want, God? I'm just a feeling and stretching myself. And because I'm not here to lecture, friends. I'm here to bring light. I'm here to let the Holy Ghost move through us. And we've got to be the same way with us. We can't just build up three weeks of service and last two revivals and 20 years of Sunday school pins. It's got to be fresh tonight. It's got to be fresh in the morning. It's got to be something new. It's got to be something vibrant. It doesn't matter how much information. What we need is inspiration. Because information will not bring transformation. Only inspiration can bring transformation. So I went crazy to try and argue and debate with people who's not hungry. Let him go on. Well, they're lost. God knows that. But God's stupid. He don't know they're lost. Because He knows they're lost. How did you become a Savior? Well, I want them saved. Well, God wanted them saved before you got here. But God can't save you and I against their will. He ain't about to save them against their will. I'm going to tell you something. I've lost more people for the kingdom of God, I think, than I've won. The Bible talks about having knowledge and having a zeal, but having a zeal without knowledge. And I was so hungry, man, when I got the Holy Ghost. Even before I got the Holy Ghost, I witnessed the people. My God, I could debate preachers. I mean it. I just ate, slept, and drank this book. Man, you, you wouldn't make me. You throw me something I could understand, I'll be back. I spent 16 hours going through concordances, prayer, study. Many here I come, buddy. I got a whole loose leaf for Let's go. I won't be right. You know what? I didn't hardly win anybody ever to God because I knew all that information. And all the information I had was right. But then all of a sudden you finally learn. And God finally says, uh, Would you mind listening to me? Can I save this world, Jesus? And Jesus said, That's what I came to do. Finally, it's back to Elijah with the, the wind and the earthquake and the fire. And, and all of a sudden here comes the a still small voice and Elijah says that's it 
And then all of a sudden, when you least expect it, you feel that. God says, talk now. And you walk up, you say a few things, and nobody gets the Holy Ghost, and nobody gets baptized in the water fountain, and no angels show up, and Elijah doesn't do backflips. But all of a sudden, you're just speaking, and the Holy Ghost says, no. And it's the hardest time to stop when you think you're not finished. Timing. Okay, listen to me. It is so powerful to realize that God is not finished with people because they're in their sunset years. Because you're in your latest years. Do you realize that Abraham had his greatest test, greatest trial, greatest triumph, greatest victory, greatest blessing, greatest revelation at 130? Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. He wasn't looking for a social security check. A little cottage over in Glory Land next to Dottie Rambo. Don't want to go. <laughs> Hear me. God put Moses center stage at 80. He was 40 in Egypt. And he blew it. And God said, well, I think I better put you in school. Watch this for a while. 40 years. So we got to get Moses killed. And finally, when Moses is killed, then the bush talks and says, Center stage, Mo! And for the next 40 years, the name that was infamous, that was on every wanted poster in the post office in Egypt, now is on every lip of an Egyptian that has a dead baby. Because now comes the emancipator, because it's time. Uh, please believe me I'm not trying to be unkind and I'm not picking on senior saints or people that's been in the church 20 years but there's something stirring in me have we lost the vision Uh, is all this stuff stories I've been in this thing 20 years just about now and I'm I'm waking up JC in the morning thinking God is going to show me something God He's going to help me see where I made a mistake and went the wrong way. God is going to talk to me. I just finished talking to him, JC. I'm telling you the truth. I said, God, I'm supposed to preach this conference this year, this conference, this camp, this conference, this meeting. I said, Lord, thank you for all the great sermons you've let me preach. But oh, lay it on me. Let me have some stuff that this world ain't never heard. Because I don't think I've ever preached the best sermons yet. I don't think the greatest revivals have ever happened yet. I don't think I know beans about the revelation of the mighty name in Jesus Christ I think there's great things yet on the horizon and I refuse to let the sun go down oh hallelujah well maybe you're not hearing me but I'll tell you what (laughs) Caleb was an old man when he said give me my mouth he said I'm as strong now for war as I was then he said I can go in and go out and I got a promise and I know I'm 80 something years old I want the mountain he said, I'll take on them giants. You know where he took that mountain? That mountain was Hebron. You know what Hebron became? A place of priests and a place of refuge. If you, some of you old timers, would attack that Hebron, you might bless generations to come. Well, that's going over like a lead balloon. Well, look at the other side of it. You think I'm kidding you? I'm trying to inspire you with triumphs. If they won't do it, maybe tragedy will. Solomon lost it all when he was old. There is no such thing as longevity with God. It's daily. And when Solomon's an old man, those crazy women he married are leading him under every kind of tree and he's offering up all these crazy sacrifices to all these false deities. He lost it all. You read his story. He's an old bitter man, man, walking away from God. He said, it's all vanity and vexation of soul. See, what profit is it? No, I've got to leave all my gold, silver, and all my trinkets and toys to a bunch of idiots. Man, I'm ticked off about that. I hate that. What an embittered old man. Lost it all in his sunset years. How can you lose everything you've ever had from God? Because you lose God in the process. Oh, Lord. Now, if that didn't inspire, let me try another one. Let's, let's go up on upbeat. Of all the fantastic things that ever happened in Elijah's life, God saved the best when he was the oldest. 
Son, I promise you, if, you, if we could get lives back here and say, what about all those things that happened to you? He said, nothing like that taxi cab ride. <laughs> In fact, woo! In fact, when he's walking with that boy, he already knows he's leaving. Which means he kept his communication up to par. He said, I'm leaving, boy. What you want? Said, God's fixing to pull some jazz off in my life that ain't never happened. What would you like? I'm fixing to scoot on out of here right away. He said, I'll take a double portion. He said, you see me when I go. You know, Elijah's saying, I'm leaving here like nobody else ain't never left here. Said, God sent him a special care for me. I'm telling you, in your senior years, in years after you've lived for God, why don't you lift up your faith? Why don't you lift up your vision and believe that today God could do something greater in your life than He's done every day previous? How many times have the Holy Ghost this church ten years or more? Why don't all you folks believe God can do something for you now? Greater than you've ever done ever in your life. How many times have the Holy Ghost ten years or more? God, man. What are you doing? I'm just trying to make it to Friday. I'm just trying to stay out of adultery and don't snort no cocaine. Pray Jesus come soon. Don't you have a Mariah you're trying to climb? Boy, silence is deafening here. Do you know that the greatest events that ever happened in a man's life named Job happened when he was an old man? He experienced his greatest tragedy and his greatest triumph. You ready for this? Brother Brinkley, he experienced in the sunset of his life the greatest revelation experience he ever had with God. Read Job chapter 41, 42. Am I right, Dean? God showed up in a whirlwind. Starts talking to him around chapter 38. God spit out stuff in National Geographic and he's still guessing about it. God said, you want to know some answers? Wow! I'm the answer man. Stand up and code yourself like a man. I'll give you a few answers. And I'll give you answers in the way of a question. Where were you? Man, when he finished with that, Job said, man, I've heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye behold thee, and I'm shutting my mouth. And God added to him twice as much as he ever had before. When? After he had that great revelation in his senior years. Am I telling you the truth? Am I telling you that after the greatest tragedy in his life, when he buried all his children, God still used him to pray the prayer of faith and get his friends healed and forgiven? The Bible said when God turned the captivity of Job around, when he prayed for those who had been his accusers, that means in your sunset years, after you've lived for God for 10, 20, or 30 years, if you walk with the King, you still can be used of God to pray the prayer of faith and see me. Miracle signs and wonders take place and you can affect generations to come. Don't die on these pews, please. Don't just come. Reach. You know that every time I, I'm telling you guys, Every time I come here, I expect to preach a blockbuster. I expect the power of God to move. I expect something grand to happen. I expect the gifts of the Spirit to begin operating. I, I just, I'm, it, it ain't no jive with me. This is truth with me. I just, God, what you going to do today? I just, something that bothers me. You just kind of, I live for God. 15 years. I hope I, I hope I can make it. What do you mean you hope you can make it? You're in charge. Yeah. What do you mean you hope you can make it? God ain't left this rapture stuff and salvation stuff with you. 
Don't you remember when you first started out and God went, whoosh? You were like a kid in a candy store. Wow. Wow. You mean you get to feel this all the time? Wow. What happened? Oh, come on now. You're freaking out. <laughs> okay. So now, I'm sorry to keep you so long. Now Abraham has got a new trial. He's got a new trial. Everybody said, got a new trial. You just keep up your stuff. I like it. You let me preach to you, Dwayne Cox. We'll be a majority, baby. You laugh all you want. I wish that other cat was here. Said, truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. That's the truth, Lord. I'm not trying to turn this into a cheerleading thing, but somebody needs to believe what I'm saying. My God, man. Look at this. This is a new trial. Brand new episode. Abraham has no idea what God's going to do. But God is fixing to take him to a new trial. But before he takes him to a new trial, Abraham has a new revelation. It's found here, right here. In verse 33, he planted a grove in Bathsheba, called there on the name of the Lord. Watch this. Never recorded in the Bible till this verse that Abraham ever called God the everlasting God. He had got a revelation of El Shaddai, which was the broad-breasted one or the self-existing God. But he had never got a revelation that he was everlasting would never change. Listen to me, you're not hearing me. Until you can get a revelation that God doesn't lie and God doesn't fail and God won't change, you'll never climb Moriah. You see, God let this come to Abraham before he goes on Moriah so he could draw strength from all the things that God had taken him through. And he can look over his shoulder and say, He never failed me here. He never failed me there. He never left me here. He was merciful here. I made a mistake here. I'm going to worship the everlasting God. What do we got? Hebrews 13 and 8. Jesus Christ is saved. Yesterday. Today. Forever. We've got one that lasts forever. That never changes. Malachi said, I am the Lord. I change not. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. He's got a revelation. He's the everlasting God. Trial and triumph had granted him a trust in the truth right now. God had never been called the everlasting God before. He looks at it now as eternal, ever good, ever there, always my friend. For our victories, listen carefully, await our visions and our voices. Triumphs follow trials. And the trial awaits our growth and maturity. We've got this thing because of this charismatic mumbo-jumbo that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years that God has somehow bypassed, aborted, and prostituted His proven way of bringing people to revelation and maturity. So now He's going to give all these bimbos divine revelations and gifts, no trials, no tests, no sacrifice, no maturity, no self-denial. You just pray, prayer language, hushabahushi, here it comes. I'll wash. Remember, remember, we're not talking bondage here. This guy's under grace. He's under grace. 430 years till the law comes. And when God starts in grace, He finishes in grace. We're under grace. I got one for you. Everybody under the law was under grace. Because it was grace that brought the law. And the law was just a revelation of how cruddy we were and how great He was. Well, I'm not getting much here. Okay, let me just read a little further. Oh, yeah, let me see. Trials. You won't like that. Okay. Oh, here's one for you. Don't rejoice over no trials or struggles. It's usually an indicator there's no life within. 
All these little jelly brains. I'm overcoming. I don't have trials. I have opportunities. You're doing better than Jesus. Even Jesus had a trial. And Peter says the trial of your faith. But then again, you're not in that because you're not of the faith. I, doesn't that just kill you? I have no trials. Just opportunities. I make all my obstacles opportunities. Opportunities for what? I don't know. I just learned that in one of those little tapes. You will never become more like Jesus aborting trouble. And truth. When we rejoice over the fact that we do not have struggles and trials, we actually have no vision of God. I'm out of time and I haven't started and I'm very sorry. You, you just stay with me just a few minutes. God is fixing to teach Abraham as well as us the hardest lesson to ever learn in life. Here it is. We are not our own. Not only we are not our own, but everything we have, everything that we are, are God's gifts to us. You may develop your voice. You may develop your ability to preach or sing or play. But it was a gift from God. Am I telling you the truth? Listen carefully now. The greatest and hardest lesson in life is to learn we are not our own. And what we have is not ours. Therefore, He can remove and still demand of us to serve. I know many people who quit God over trouble. Who stopped tithing and supporting and giving because of trouble. And when you and I do that, we say, God, you ain't worth it. And you are second to me. Everything we have is God's gift. When God stripped Job of all his children, you say, wasn't fair. Ain't for you to say. The children were gifts. And God took his gift. And still expects Job to worship. But his wife can't worship because she thinks they're not gifts. They're mine. Life is a gift. Yes, it is. Ability to acquire is a gift. Possessions are gifts. Time, health, children, ministry, talents. God's desire is to develop us. Listen carefully. The devil's desire is to destroy us. Our flesh's desire is to avoid the trouble. That's why Romans 9, 6 says, They are not all Israel which are of Israel. But they that are of faithful Isaac. For Isaac is the promised seed. How do we become children of Abraham? According to Galatians 3 and 7, we are only children and heirs with Abraham by faith. That is not mental assent. He does not get on Moriah mentally. He gets there physically. Spiritually and emotionally. Amen. We all desire. Am I doing okay? Isn't that a terrible thing? What else would you say, right? We all desire Abraham's faith. We all would love to have Abraham's title, friend of God. And you get a little happier here. We all want the glorious results. Of his trials. And none of us want the trials. Well, at least we're getting honest.
I'll take the car if you can keep the payments. I'll take the house. You send the mortgage payment to my brother-in-law. I'll be there Friday for the check. I won't be there Monday through Friday for the work. I'm going to the rapture for the crown, but I ain't going to carry the cross. Honey, the cross comes before the crown. The garden comes before the ascension. You can't have resurrection till you have death. Oh, my, 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 my. I'm trying the best again here. But triumph flows from trial. Triumph flows from trial. I don't like trials any better than you. I wish to God they'd go away. I'm finally learning after 20 years. They ain't going away. I got more for you. Guess what? If you fail this one, you get to repeat the class. Is anybody in this place, I know you have care, anybody else that's really high educated like I am, I studied algebra. Anybody? If any of you that studied it and how to do it. Do you know that when you go to school in algebra, you know what they do in algebra? At least they did when I was a kid. They give you an algebra book. Do you know that if you're real smart, when you look in the algebra book, you can look in the back, it's got all the answers. And if you're a crook like I used to be, you would say, my God, I got the teacher's copy. And I wasn't about to give it back either. And finally one day when you talk to the teacher, you say, hey, teach. Uh, you know, it's beginning the best of me. I got a book here. It's got all the answers in it. He said, oh, all the books have the answers. Watch what he says. Algebra is not about answers. Algebra is about how you arrive at answers. Christianity ain't about answers. I don't think you're hearing me. I said Christianity ain't about answers. It's about how we arrive at answers. Now, when you fall in love with Jesus Christ, He is the ultimate answer. But He's going to teach you formulas how to make the answers work in each situation. Don't you see, if there was no reason for trial or testing... When you and I got the Holy Ghost, somebody needs to come up and usher and say, God bless you. And we bury you the same service. At least we know you'd be saved. Really, think about it. If all God wants to do is save you, then when you get the Holy Ghost talking in tongues, uh, and I baptize you in the water, as soon as I baptize you talking in tongues, I put a rope around your neck, I keep you underneath there, God. You ship you out in the bag, you're on your way to glory. But when you show up in glory, you'll just be a baby. God's got to have some people that are mature. Don't you get it? Well, maybe I'm being... I don't mean to be funny. I don't know why we bought glass. I don't mean to be funny. Okay. <laughs> Watch this. There are two, two kinds of temptations listed in the Bible. One comes in James 1, 13 through 15, which comes from us. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. So it flows through us, but the instigator is the Satan one who works with our weaknesses to draw us away. The other tempter or tester or trial person is God who tries to work with our weaknesses and produce out of them strengths and draws us away from ourselves to Himself. Why we need to be sensitive is so that we know who's pulling off the test. I'm telling you. Oh boy. Real biblical faith. I'm almost there. Real biblical faith 
is believing and acting without evidence. And so when God comes up to Abraham and says, after these things, God did tempt or test Abraham. He's ready now. And so, if you'll just let me have a few more minutes, I'll give you five principles of a test. I, I'm sorry, I want to go to Moriah as bad as you do. But, but we need to understand what it takes to go to Moriah. First, the first principle of testing or trial. Ready? A test or trial that flows to you from God makes no apparent sense. It absolutely rocks logic and reason. You think you can come up with any logic or reason out of Job's ten dead kids? Of some of you that have suffered with loved ones that have got hurt or killed or crippled or maimed or lost this or that? Does that make any kind of sense? Reason will rage and ridicule. The word that tests us and tries us comes from beyond the natural realm, therefore transcends reason and logic. There are no props to lean upon, only the word that's impressed and talked to you. Moses in the bush seems ridiculous. How am I going to put on a jailbreak for three million people with a stick? Read it. Moses argues with God, gives him all these reasons why it won't work. Why? Because he's reasoning. I mean, you know, reason is raging when, when God tells Moses, just put the stick over the Red Sea and, and I'll open the water. What? We've got chariots coming here. How do you think Moses felt when he just stood out there by himself? You know, we like to think this is a Cecil B. DeMille and Charlton Heston movie, and I'm sorry, folks. Old Mo comes walking over and people see the dust coming from the chariots and they say, what has God said? He said, me take this stick and just stand out here. All right. Boy, don't preachers get damned and criticized by the people they're trying to save. All right. As he stands out there in the front all alone with this stick and all the giants of theology and faith and knowledge back there. What is this? I, I told you when he came with that crowd about the bush talking, the man was fried. We're fixing to get killed here in a few minutes. We've got a few hundred of the greatest chariots coming from Pharaoh's army. And look, look at this dude. <laughs> You don't think that was a trial of Moses' faith? When he has nothing around him that could encourage the word that he feels God gave him. And he has to stand alone. Okay, point number two. I don't mean to keep... Let's go back to point number one. I got one more thing I want to say. Remember what I said? A, a trial makes no apparent sense. Don, do you think it made any sense to the whole nation of Israel to walk around Jericho quiet? We're showing them heathens, bless God. But the fear of God in them, guys. The looks and the stares from the wall. And the preacher said, don't say nothing. Walk. Weird. Why? God not going to share His glory with flesh. He's going to make the flesh get to a place where it's ridiculous. And then God's going to say, here I come. Hallelujah. Point number two. Faith. Faith is never perfected 
without suffering. James 2.22. I don't have time to go through all of it now. But this is how you can recognize a trial from God. Faith will never be perfected without suffering. Saving faith not only gives us salvation, but it gives us the ingredients for transformation to a level that the natural man can never take us. The scripture says in Hebrews 5 and 8 that Jesus was made perfect through his suffering. Paul says in Acts 14, 20 through 2, we must, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That pretty well kills that charismatic jelly. If you're having a trial, there's something wrong with you. No, there ain't. Ain't nothing wrong with me. Me and Jesus been in trial. Jesus made perfect through suffering. How come you don't have to suffer? How come you don't have no trials? Maybe you're dead. Dead people ain't got no trials. Bible says they are in a place where the soul ceases from troubling. Point number three. One of the principles of a real trial is that we have to learn how to obey without knowing all the implications of the Spirit's request. Hagar and Ishmael both were the result of discontent by Abraham and Sarah because they didn't know how, why, or when. Abraham was called to go out not knowing where he went, and he did well. But later, on numerous occasions, he failed and lied and made moves through fear and not faith. Faith must leave details with him who is faithful. Okay. Point number four. When you're really going through a God-sent, heaven-sent trial, we may not be permitted to let anyone else know what God is doing in us or has revealed to us or is leading us to or through. Remember, when God gets ready to do this, the next two verses say, Take thy son, thy only son, Isaac, to a place that I will show you. And he went with him. And the scripture says when he saw it, three days later, Moriah, he told the servant, stay here, and the lad and I go yonder to worship. Notice what he did now. I can't share with some of you the intimate things that God's going to put me through. They are not for your criticizing nor for your gawking. I know firsthand I've made mistakes in this. I repented over this. I asked God to help me and visit me again and I'll do my very best through His grace never to do that. God spoke to me. Spoke to me audibly, directly through a man. Called me by name. Told me things He was going to do in my life. They burned my fire in me. It was not brag, boast. It was, it was ecstasy. It was jubilancy. It was, it was so happy. And I went and shared with people who were my intimate friends the things that God told me He was going to do and they fell over my dead lead. And not a one of them ever received it. In fact, they came back and hit me in the face. And the Spirit said, Be quiet. There's things you can't share. Notice that he said, We go yonder to worship. He did not think a trial was a horror like we do. He said, It's a place where I'll go deal with my friend and I'll worship. Remember, he's already told, offer up your son. You've got to kill your son. You've got to get rid of the promise. He said, man, as far as I'm concerned, any trial that God takes me through is a beautiful opportunity for me to worship. Why is it that when all of us see, all of us seem to have a trial or a test, boy, the worship is a bummer. We don't look at it as an opportunity to magnify God. Please, somebody say, man, I'm getting nervous. I would say God will make a way. He doesn't, we don't know how He's going to make a way, but He knows. Scripture says that when the Lord spoke to Mary, 
she buried Jesus, it says these words, Mary pondered these things in her heart and kept them secret. Some things you just don't share. Leave them alone. They're between you and God. Nobody will appreciate what God's doing. Okay, I'm almost done. The worst suffering may yet lie in the future. We are never finished growing or maturing or learning. Beyond being willing, we must just simply do it. We all want to say we're willing to abandon, we're willing to abandon, we're willing to abandon, but we must do it. Casting all your care upon Him. Mark 8.35 said, Whosoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whosoever loses life for my sake will keep it unto life everlasting. Here's a good test. If you and I are constantly seeking to spare ourselves, secure ourselves, protect ourselves, we are actually advertising we have never abandoned ourselves to Him. If we are always scheming and finagling, we are advertising, I don't trust Him. You can't trust God. And we usually come back with a cliche, well, God gave you a brain, didn't He? We're not called by God to figure out and know the end. God desires from us a living sacrifice. He desires to strip away from us everything. And when it seems like there's nothing left that He can use, now we're ready to be used. Consecration is the most costly item in God's economy. You better be very careful when you decide to consecrate. There is a tremendous peril and price when you get ready to consecrate to God. Because the closer you get, here, I'm going to hurt you now, the more worthless all your treasures and your feelings and your desires and mine become to God. The closer we get to God, the more expendable we become to Him. John the Baptist lived so close to God that God said, I refuse to let you do any miracles and I'll let you die in your prime and you'll get no credit for anything. How do you like that, John? Neat living close to me, ain't it? See, we got this concept when you get close to God, you're greatly anointed and used of God. You don't want to read Elijah's life. The using by God are only momentary mountains and a lot of valleys and a lot of brooks of Cherith, and a lot of widows of Zarephath, and there's a lot of places of hiding. There's a lot of places of emptying out self. Consecration has got a peril with it. That's why our generation, Pentecost, Apostolic, anybody, is cursed with the lack of consecrated Christianity. It costs a lot. I want to live close to God. You're asking a dangerous thing. When you say you want to live close to God, you're telling God, you can turn me upside down. You can rip from me my children, my treasures, my finance. You can send me here. You can choose not to heal me. You can choose to bless others above me and put me out of the limelight. And you can just twist me and turn me like you would empty out the moisture out of a rag. That's how close you want to be. And when you get finished, God, if you decide not to heal or bless, you just throw me over there and use because I was just close to you so you could get the glory. Different kind of look at consecration now, ain't it? Ray, would you get me one scripture? I'll close. I'm sorry. It's 5 after 9. I'm very sorry. Hebrews 11. I just want to finish this. So. I ain't finished it. I guess I've jumped all over the place here. I ain't, I ain't done. I don't know how we're ever going to get this mountain. I just want to show you something. This is so powerful. What? I want you to read Hebrews 11. And I want you to read, please... Uh, where am I here? About verse 12, I think. Yeah, verse 12. I'm sorry. Listen to this. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. As good as dead. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith. Listen to this. Now here, here it is. We're coming to the culmination of our lesson. Five minutes and I'll be finished. Listen to this. Read. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Not having received the promise. But having seen them afar off. Seen them afar off. Watch this. Here it comes. Three yeah. key words. Oh, God. And were persuaded. And were persuaded. Of them. Go ahead. And embraced them. Second word. And embraced them. And confessed 
that they were strangers and pilgrims on third earth. word and confessed he said these all died in the faith they heard the promise they saw the promise but it was never fulfilled yet three things were evident in all these great people one they were persuaded that can only happen with the heart they embraced that can only happen with the will and they confessed that can only happen with the mouth only the mouth listen to me I have a revelation I have a revelation 1991 Christianity has been, become nothing but a bunch of people who are cheap pimps giving out precious truths who have absolutely customized Christianity watch what they've done they reversed it they took God's word no fear of God and they reversed it watch this is about faith and climbing Moriah they did this so that now it's not persuade embrace confess now it's confess Christ confession comes after embracing and embracing follows persuading we have people who are being instructed confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who've never even been persuaded who've never even been challenged to use their will to embrace all that it means for him to be Lord you see how cheap we've made this great majestic message just confess Jesus just believe Jesus but he gives us the mathematical equation and he gives us analytically one, two, and three they didn't receive it but they were persuaded right, absolutely. and they embraced and then they confessed yes. in that order absolutely what made Abraham say here I am he was persuaded his friend was faithful he embraced God will do something miraculous with Isaac and he confessed here I am Ooh. almost finished oh God people are being motivated by guilt to confess Christ and when you reverse the order you have false Christians and powerless people it's persuasion then embracing then confession and finally conformity okay though I'm finishing with what Ray was reading it says they confessed confessed what? Right. they confessed what? strangers ah and this pilgrims is, you hear what he said? Strangers they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims watch this this is a revelation on the earth on the earth here's what they're saying right. we're confessing this world is not my home, my home. Right. I'm just passing through right next verse is good too. their confession was not about their origins it was about their destination right right read on Ray for they that say such things Woo! declare plainly plainly that they seek a country hey it did not say they declare verbally no plainly right. that means so you can see action right understand they were going there. Read. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, if it had to do with origins, they might have had opportunity to have returned. They might have went back. Brother Brinkley, it ain't got to do with our origin. It don't matter whether we come from the gambling hole, the honky tonk, the bar, or we came from a good family. Origin ain't got nothing to do with it. We're confessing about a destination. We're going someplace. Right. Okay, I'm finished right now. Read. 
But now they desire a better country. They desire a better country. That is that a heavenly. A heavenly. Don't you see? It's about destination. Right. Three. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Oh, Gene, are you still here? Am I making sense? Watch this one. This is powerful. Here is faith's consequence. God's approval and God's removal. I didn't do nothing for you. Okay. Read on. For he hath prepared for them a city. You get it? The consequence of that kind of faith is God's approval and then God's removal. Read. By faith Abraham, when he was tried... Oh, that's enough. I don't want any more. Thank you. Here we go. I'm finished. The highest compliment that can ever be paid to a human being is for it to be said of you and I that God is not ashamed to be my God. Scripture said because of their persuasion and their embracing and their confession and their willing to be led to a place they didn't find yet. God said being that you're not ashamed of me I ain't ashamed of you. Stand with me now. Thank you. Very nice. So, all I'm trying to tell you is that God gives us a little bit of heaven to go to heaven with. Abraham is ready at last. He has become totally sensitive to God's voice. He is now completely submissive. He is wholly yielded. He is totally prepared. He is now laying prostrate at the feet of his holy and faithful friend. He simply answers, Here I am. Like Isaiah of old, you never say, Here am I, send me, until you're ready. Until you're totally committed. Notice carefully as we close, Abraham is not even considering the new test or the new trial. He's not even considered the cost, the rejection, the pain, the hardship. None of those have been considered. Here is the only thing that Abraham now considers. My king, my lord, my God, my friend has called and has requested of me a favor. And I've learned to love him and I've learned to trust him. So I just simply say, here I am. The common instance of life and the rare exceptional moments of life are all opportunities for us to develop and mature God's grace in our lives and to magnify Him and to make Him beautiful. But one writer said the chariots of God are 20,000. That means there are opportunities every day landing at our door that God wants to show Himself strong in our lives and to bring Him pleasure. Abraham... Abraham! Here I am. Abraham, got another trial for you. Take your son and kill him on Moriah for me. Offer him as a sacrifice unto me. Sure. We'll be on Moriah, the Lord willing, next Wednesday. Sorry I've taken so long to get you there. Lord it's been longer than I meant to be I'm very sorry and I haven't been as good as I wanted to be and I'm sorry about that but now it's all over and I just have to leave the word with the people and I just thank you for trials and tests and I'm also sorry for so many chances and opportunities I've had that either my ears have been dull of hearing or I've not been sensitive to the voice of God or I've murmured during the operation or I've, I've misunderstood the test. But I pray that you help us now because we want to honor you and we want to be very instant in our response. Be able to say with Abraham of old, here I am, what do you want? Help us not to look at the cost or the pain 
or the situation or the ramifications or the results but to just somehow have a concept of you being so faithful and what a wonderful friend that he that is promised is also faithful and you will do it go with us Lord and bless us and help us and give us strength to live for God oh Lord in Jesus name we pray amen could we sing that song before we leave God bless you oh yeah like you heaven's not my home then Lord what will I do Friendly, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord.